Kevin. I realise the time is ticking on, so I wanted to get a little bit to the academia because I mean, what makes me interested, in particularly in you, apart from I like you, is that you have this this discrepancy between or like schism between yeah. non-reason, completely you know, a tradition which is completely devoted, which doesn't strike. I did. It's very different to how you've immediately come across as an academic with a clearly very bright mind and an ordered kind of way of thinking, you know, and um, I never really understand how you got from that point to to the uh, the the academic stuff and why as well, just uh, apart from that you could make a bit of money and, and keep going back to India. Well, Jeb, but just a quick comment before I answer that, and that is, you, you know, the uh, religious traditions do have theologians, and theologians are intellectuals who take philosophical categories and modes of reasoning, and they apply them in support of the transrational claims of their scriptures. So you do have Augustine, you mentioned, and Aquinas, who are probably the most brilliant minds in Western, Barclay. In Western yeah. Barclay. These are yeah. as brilliant as anybody else. They can hold their ground with anybody. And likewise, in India, you have your Shankars and your Ramanujas and your Jiva Goswamis and your Rupa Goswamis, amazing intellectuals who are, are just showing that that accepting transrational truth claims need need not conflict in all cases sometimes that there is con conflict need not conflict with rational uh you, you know in other words it can be rational to posit transrational truths it can hmm. be a rational in other words reason can understand its own limitations hmm. like patanjali where the mind has to neroda how the mind the mind yeah I suppose, I suppose but if you've been in using that then might you would have got into another tradition no i mean the tradition yeah, you're in is it, it just it, it's right? very transrational yeah but i just wanted to make that comment yeah 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 i mean you know like there, there's not that are the argument based and yarn yeah. garner you know kind of like yeah. uh, thread going through the back to you stuff so much right but there is there's is there oh, okay. absolutely. there's incredible i mean if you read ramanujas and madhavas and the jiva goswamis there's a very very rich philosophical well, I have to call it theological, but remember, theology is philosophy being used in, in support of transrational, transphilosophical uh, um, claims. In other words, philosophy can understand its own limitations. And, and that's why I brought in Patanjali. The hmm. mind can realize that it itself is the problem. So the mind, what is Patanjali? Chitta Vritti Narodaha. Who's narodering? The mind is narodering. What's it narodering? Itself. The mind is narodering the mind. So likewise with reason and philosophy, philosophy can understand it. You, you can only get so far. You cannot understand truth. Truth can only be revealed. The beginning of the Vedanta Sutras, all of the Vedantins, verse number three, Right, Shastra Yonit Vach, verse number four, that it has to be re revealed. But that doesn't mean you throw reason away, but reason understands its own limitations. And then one opens oneself up for revelation. And, and, and in my case, when I opened my heart to revelation, that what we might call Bhagavan came to me in the form of Gopal, you know, Vrindavan Krishna. For somebody else, it might be Shiva or Jesus Christ or anything else. So, so that part of it was not rational. You know, the fact that I ended up in the Brindavan tradition, and I don't know how why. That, then I I just see that as the call of Bhagavan. That's Bhagavan called me, and or rather, I I opened my heart to Bhagavan, and Bhagavan pulled me into the Brindavan tradition. It might be different with someone else. So um, that's what happens if we open. That's Bhakti. Bhakti is that you open your heart to something higher than yourself. Materialists don't do that. Shankara sort of does it in an in a intermediary sort of way. Anyway, let's not do, let's not take that detour. Um, so where do we want to go, Adam? Uh, where did what did I? Yeah, I suppose just for for the yeah. sake of the listenership, maybe just say what happened after you left and how you got into the position you did because it's kind of interesting how you know. Well, the, when uh, I left, I, I when I left all that, and I, I knew that I couldn't live in an ashram. That you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to. My, my moral compass wasn't no longer comf comfortable there. Um, I w actually, my plan was to teach English as a foreign. You know, I was like you. I was, you know, 
I mean, us Brits, we have this in our DNA, you know, this kind of, a, maybe, you know, I don't make colonial times or whatever it was, but we have this sort of uh, vagabondic kind of, <laughs> you know, we, we can, we travel. I mean, it's just part of our yeah. heritage. So I was thinking I would travel, um, I would teach English as a foreign language in, you know, Bahrain and the Gulf states. Yeah, make some money. Months, yeah, you yeah. Make, make some good money. Yeah. And you and then live in India for nine months on my own steam. Right. And I could I would be, you know, I would go and study wherever I wanted to study. I'd have money in my pocket. I wouldn't be uh, dependent on an ashram that might have uh, questionable uh, institu institutional authorities. And that was the plan. And to get the better jobs at that point, you know, I'm not a kid anymore sleeping under a tree. Right. Although sometimes. But anyway, so then um, so then I then I thought, well, let me get a, a, a B.A., because then you get better jobs, and I and and then let me get a, you know teaching English as a foreign language certificate, right? So yeah, in Ter Tehran you didn't need all of that, but now we're in the eighties, and you know you, you needed it up your game a little bit. So I thought, okay, I'll get a BA, and I'll get in Sanskrit. So I got to get in something. I get in, <laughs> happen to be in New York City, and I've been studying Sanskrit obviously in India. I get a degree in Sanskrit. And then I'll get this teaching English as a foreign language certificate and I'll go off to Bahrain. I've been to Bahrain. I, I've been there I, 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 and, and, and all of these places. And, you know, try, you know I, I understood how, that, how it sort of worked. What and are you doing in New York? I was there because when I was still a Krishna, the, the, my so-called guru at that time, who turned out to be a, um, you know, turned out to be very questionable. Uh, <laughs> right. Completely and utterly compromised. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. just leave it at that. Yeah. This is going on there. Yeah. But um, but but before that all became exposed and revealed, um, he brought me. I had no intention of coming to America. Okay. I had no interest in America. I was Euro, you know, Europe, Middle East, um, Middle East, and and India. That, those are my sort of area. The, 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 those are the cultures that attracted me. Middle East, especially, yeah, as well as India, yeah. But then. Um, uh, so he, there I was in New York, and so then I, you know, and uh, so I just happened to be there because of that, I, uh, accidentally. And then I, and I was living in the ashram still when I left the ashram. Then there was another ashram where you, it was kind of a halfway house, and I stayed there for a bit. And then I started going to school there, and then I got, and then Columbia University. Somehow or other, I got in. I just, you know, hustled my way in, basically. And they gave me credits for my A levels. They gave me like a whole year's oh. university for A levels. Oh wow! So then that... I, you know, I took a loan for the first semester, and then after that, they, yeah, I came in with Hindi. You know, good. And then you could get at that time there was financial support for in university for, for these uh, for these languages for these kinds of non-Western. And you'd learn the language being there for three or four years, right? Yeah. Time, yeah, and then I got that. It was called FLAS, Foreign Language Areas, and there was, and I think what happened was the Indian government owed America a bunch of money, and they paid it back by funding people like me in university. So my whole education was pay, paid for through this language fellowship. So then I, got, I thought, okay, I get that's nice. I'll get my BA, and then I'll do that, my game plan, right? Go over to Bahrain, you know, which I done. Mm numerous times so it meant nothing to me jumping on a plane and popping off and anyway you're are we running out of time so but then the doors just opened i just went sailed through to the ma and my my met my teachers took me under their wing and you know and i got along with everybody and next thing i knew i was in the phd pro though that's all right i'll get phd and i'll get really good jobs in bahrain and then at the, and then I and then at the end of the phd i thought well that's it then that was nice uh, that was unexpected nice little ride and I get a phone call from Harvard saying, do you want to come up and teach Hinduism for a couple of years, you know? And that was one of like manna from heaven, you know? And I thought, well, yeah. And that opened up the whole academic, absolutely and utterly unanticipated, uh, you know? It was like that story in Brindavan sitting on the bus. I, that phone call was, I, you know, I never for a minute thought I would be a professor. Oh, not at all. Um, and they gave, they contacted you because of the subject of your PhD somehow yeah, that you were I, releasing yeah. articles or papers. They saw all of that, you know. And I, yeah, I, yeah. I was doing. I did a very interesting, you know, controversial topic, the Indo-Aryan invasion debate. So I did that for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a real topic. Still controversial, really. Yeah. Still, you know, yeah, about, yeah, that yeah. put me on the map in in a sense. Yeah, I, right. I didn't. I didn't. That wasn't anticipated either. <clears throat> but then, once I was at Harvard for like three years or something. 
then I thought, well, you know what? I could make this work. This is great. I'm, I'm reading the text I, will, I want to read. I'm sharing with the students everything that I'd be sharing anywhere else. I mean, this is what I would be doing if I was sitting in India. I'd be reading, studying these texts, learning Sanskrit. And here I was doing it and, and, and getting paid and in a you know, kind of in a respectable position in society. You know, just flow with this. You know, this is winds are blowing this way. I kept going. And then once I was Harvard, because you're at Harvard, then I was working the letterhead, publishing, getting, you know, book publishers. Oh, you're Harvard. You must be, your work must be good. Must be so good. Was, yeah. yeah. Contracts, yeah. university press, all of this. But a boom, you know, that just <laughs> after that, I got on the job market and um, bang, I was getting, you know, I was very competitive because of some of this, you know, and that was it. That's how it all started. That's how the door. You never felt, co you never felt conflicted. Effect. Did you feel conflicted in the academic career with yeah. your with spiritual? Yeah, yeah, I did. I felt I was in the closet because back then, it, you know, back then. You couldn't say. Um... Oh, you could say you were a Buddhist. There was something. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because Majamika, Majamika kind of makes, you know, and you know, it's so intellectualized. Well, yeah, right? It's pretty intellectual, yeah. Yeah. Deconstructive, yeah. you know. Yeah. Got you in the right yeah, yeah, deconstructive. Yeah. Yeah, it's deconstructive. So that yeah. that that was okay. But to be a you know, blaring hint a blaring Hindu, right? Doing pujas in the cupboards. Yeah. All yeah. of that, you little... know, that was in the cupboard, literally. I was literally yeah. in the closet. My deities yeah. were actually in a closet. <laughs> but anyway, now I don't I don't care. I mean, I got ten years. No. I walk around with my neck beads and you know, <laughs> a gnarly beard, you know. But um, but back then I thought I was the first, actually, the first you know Westerner who was um, got tenure track and you know certainly in the Krishna tradition. But you know now that now it's a little bit more accepted now. You know, with all this p political correctness and you know you you, you know all that. yeah, you have to allow people to have weird oh. weird fancies, don't you? But behind the scenes there's still you know academe is right. much, much more about context you know that you know how do these traditions get constructed what are the agendas what the, 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 it's much more about context and content so you know my advice if i i think you yeah. want to wind down at some point but if anybody wants to take that journey and if you're a yogi or in any sort of a way um and if you're a practitioner in any of these traditions I would take the route philosophy of religion because in philosophy of religion you can actually look at content you can actually study right. art, you can look at theology you can look at i would take that because this academic study of religion in many departments is still very much about um social context yeah uh, from which these the traditions emerge and you know post marx post foucault what are the power mm. dis discourses embedded in it all and if that's not your cup of tea and if you really just, if you want to read, you know, go into a Sanskrit department, but you won't get a job if you do that. But philosophy of religion would be the way to go, especially since many Western philosophy departments are realizing that they, they, they cannot talk about world philosophy and then just study, you know, Aristotle and, and Plato through to, you know, whatever the modern, you know, modern philosophers are. They're realizing how myopic and provincial they've been. And there, there's a scramble now to, you know, bring in African philosophy, Indian philosophy, and so forth. This is a great, I would say, the next ten years. I don't know any Af African uh, philosophy really. Yeah, I would say the next ten years for your viewers, if anyone right. is mm. practitioner and interested in an academic possible way of maintaining yourself and still doing your svadhyaya, I would say go for philosophy of religion. You know, train yourself in a bit of Western, but do your Indian stuff. And then when you're on the job market, you'll be able to say, well, look, I'm, I can bring in Eastern philosophy. Adam, mm. oh, does that mean you want to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, so I, I thought, oh, I'd like to stay on for ages with you. But I just have one last question. Yeah. Why Why did you do the, I mean, you're, you're most well known for the Yoga Sutras book, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, at least in the yoga circles, anyway, yeah. you're, you, maybe not in your yeah. academic circles. Yeah. But I mean, the more I, I mean, I've read the book, it's great. Uh, but the more I think about that book and I read it quite often, I still have to read it quite often, I mean, it doesn't really flow with uh, with your interests, right? I mean, no. well, why did you get, why did you do that? Well, you know, I tell you why. I was teaching at Harvard and I get a call from, um, a yoga studio, Patricia Walden's Iyengar Yoga Studio okay. in Cambridge. And she says, you know, could you come and teach the Yoga Sutras? And I, and I was teaching Yoga Sutras in the context of Hindu philosophy. So it would be like two, three weeks in a larger context. And I said, well, you know, I could, but you know, I'm, I'm much more grounded in the Gita. And she said, okay. Anyway, I started going to the studio and teaching, you know, 
were teaching the yoga sutras and you know and then i would do classes and it was just an exchange thing and, and it was a nice you know and then i realized there's this huge community because i didn't have i didn't really have my finger on the pulse of the asana community you know i knew the heavy duty ashram community in india and the tradition but i didn't have any re real re connection with this high street main street you know yoga studio community I realize there's this millions, this huge community, and they see Patanjali in a canonical way. Mm. It's like the canonical text, and they don't have a clue what. And and whatever they're reading about Patanjali is so not what the tradition, not what the traditional, you know, the Yoga Sutra and the commentaries. I I need somebody needs to, because either you had these highly specialized academic literal translation Vachaspati in a Misra. You can't read that if you don't have, know, yeah. know what what they're talking about. They're having conversations with, with their uh, with their with their you know with their context in the 12th century. Somebody <laughs> needs to write a commentary completely grounded in that. None of this hip, you know, none of this modern, <laughs> none of that, none of this psycho babble, right? No psycho babble, babble, but the, but bring about the tradition, but you know, articulated in a way that's accessible, right? And that's why I did it. And then when I did it, I thought, well, I, well that's great. I loved it. I love Patanjali. There's nothing in Patanjali that conflicts. It's just that it's Ishvara light. It's Ishvara like it's bare minimum, right? It's Ishvara like, you know, tiny, you know, it's in 12 ver verses or not even that. It's like 12, you know, 20 words. Once I'd done that, I thought, well, okay. And I, I didn't expect it to be such a huge success. Not, not at all. Well, it has been, though. I mean, the Yoga Sutras is. People, I mean, it is overrepresented, right? I mean, the would you say the Yoga Sutras is, you know, this is the one book that, that people have now, right? And I think it's taken for the sum total of yoga philosophy, also. Yeah, yeah, it's okay though. It is really a great term, it really does. Okay. It, it's you know, really speaks about the mind, about consciousness, about meditation. I mean, if people read it in its grounded in its proper traditional context, they're that that's genuine, they, they're gonna have a genuine sort of map. That they can follow or not to this to, to, to a real spiritual experience but then after that i thought okay well you know i need to then um i need to then um don't, don't answer it just if you don't mind uh, <laughs> when i did the follow-up which was the bhakti yoga i thought well, hang on you know i would well, now let's let's use that as a as a link to you know the yoga sutras um so then the bhakti yoga book was meant to be a sequel and now i need to bridge those two because the other canonical text is the gita so now i'm working on the gita not the 60s gurus or not that but the, the six big traditional pre-modern commentaries three advaita three dwaita you know three three on each side let the yoga community understand first of all what these vedanta issues are and make their own informed opinion right. all they need is for someone to say this is what shankara says this is what ramanuja say now you decide whether that's a real the better interpretation of here's the literal translation of the gita verse and that's my so the six received commentaries on the gita yes right. shankara, no, i didn't know that Mother, right. all, no no there's a lot more than that but that's we can say six big prominent you can't prominent. do it yeah, yeah. Edmund, when are you going to get it out? Because you've been talking about that for the last yeah, years yeah, on podcasts and stuff. I know, I know, but this is a long project. This is, this, <laughs> I'm, you know, this is going to be my last contribution to the yoga community in in writing, and then after that, um, then I have you know, a couple. Of, I'm working on a couple of other things, but anyway, that so what the whole, all of this is to say, um, what am I saying? That yeah, yeah, how can we how can we wrap this up as yeah. a little as a little anecdotal story? I don't think we can, but I mean, it gives you a flavor. Okay, here here so, we go. There's yeah. a way, you know, there was a lot of dissonance for me between, mm. you know, traditional, what I'd been schooled in and the sort of academic reductionistic, mostly materialistic context-based context, context -based study. And there was a lot of dissonance for me. That's why I did the, my first PhD was on, you know, was there an indo Aryan? Were there even people living in India in, you know, right. in these early periods? Right. But but now I can, you know you get used to wearing different hats, because there's different kinds of questions. Academe are, are interested in historical questions. Who's interested? In, they're asking different questions. Who's in, influencing? The, you know who archaeology, linguistics, cross fertilization. Uh, you know what power? You know Brahmanism. You know and so forth. 
And those are the questions you get in academe, whereas the, the you know, traditional point of view, you're seeking Brahman, you're seeking Atman, you're seeking Bhagavan. So you're asking different questions. It doesn't really matter if it's historically real. In other words, was there a Mahabharata war 3,108 BCE, right? Was there a Satya Yuga 2 million years ago? Clearly, that's going to con conflict with all of our, you know, modern ways of reconstructing history and so forth and the human race. But you get, I think both have their dharmas and you have to respect the dharmas and the goals are different. And, 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 and so if you're going to take this journey, you have, you're not going to be able to reconcile them. You're not going to be able to, to make them fit because if you, you, if you try to do that, you're going to take massive liberties on both sides. You're going to, you're going to completely misrepresent both sides in order to find these points of commonality. For me, much, much better. They're two completely different domains of discourse when you're in that sort of academic culture, you know, context sort of centric one, you're asking questions that are dharmic, that are, that are appropriate for the dharma, objective, analytical, historical, power laden kinds of questions. And when you're in the domain of the tradition, you know, of the sort of yoga type world and bhakti and Vedanta, just, you know, you're asking different because your goals are different and your questions are leading you to a different kind of goal, which is an experiential goal. Mm. You keep those two aspects distinct, then you, you won't be in a constant state of dissonance. And you can, in your experience, you, you've well, managed to- Well, it took me a while to get there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was in a state of dissonance for a lot longer than I'd care to, I'd care to admit, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, All right. that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a wrap. All right, yeah. lovely to see you. All, All right. right, we're going to have a bit nice, some bit of a backdrop behind you next time. Right? <laughs>